Okay, so for this problem, we're asked to calculate the surface area of the piecewise regular surface M1 union M2, where M1 is the portion of the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, and z is less than or equal to 1. M2 is the disk that fills the hole in the cut sphere. Well, let's start by drawing a picture so we can get a better idea of what our surface actually looks like. So, I know that M1 starts to define a sphere of radius 2 centered at the origin. So let me draw the whole sphere to start. Well, not the best, but I tried. And then z has to be less than or equal to 1. So it's going to cut the sphere 3 quarters of the way up. So take off my top. And I'm left with something kind of like that. And then m2 is the disk that fills that hole in the cutout sphere. So I have kind of a sphere that just has a, a flat top. Okay, well we know that for piecewise regular surfaces, the, air, the surface area of the union of two surfaces is just the surface area of each of them added together. So, if you want to see it in symbols, that's what it looks like. So basically, we're going to calculate the surface area of each region and then add them together. Let's start with M1. So first, I'm going to need to parametrize the surface. Well, it'd be nice to use spherical coordinates, right? So let's go ahead and write down what each coordinate is going to be. So x is rho sine phi cosine theta, y is rho sine phi sine theta, and z is rho cosine phi. Well, remember that rho is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So I'm actually given that as 4. So the region I'm going to integrate over and kind of set my surface area around is phi and theta. So let me go ahead and put a 4 in for each of those rows. Two. I misspoke. Rho is the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. I'm sure you all caught that mistake, but it is fixed now. Okay, so let's set up the parametrization of this surface. So. Gonna need a little bit more room. We all remember these, right? Okay. So to calculate this surface area, I need to find ds, which is the cross product of r theta and r phi. So let's go ahead and find those partial derivatives. Well, let's take a look at the first coordinate. So 2 sine phi is treated like a constant, so it'll be carried through. And the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta. Okay, so same thing for the second one. 2 sine phi is a constant. And then the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. And 2 cosine phi is not a function of theta, so it's just going to be 0. Okay, 
Now let's calculate the partial derivative with respect to phi. Well, now in the first coordinate, 2 cosine theta is the constant. And then the derivative of sine phi is cosine phi. And then again, 2 sine theta is a constant. The derivative of sine phi will be cosine phi. And now I have 2 cosine phi, and the derivative of that is going to be negative 2 sine phi. Okay, so now I need to find the cross product of these vectors. And I'm going to do it using a matrix. Well, kind of. I don't really feel like rewriting all of that. So... With a little creativity, I have my matrix. So to find the cross product, I'm going to kind of use a cofactor expansion. So first, let's take a look at i. So ignore this column and find the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. So I have 2 sine phi cosine theta times negative 2 sine phi minus zero. So four sine squared phi cosine theta. All right, now let's take a look at J. So I'm gonna cut out the middle column and I have negative two sine phi sine theta times negative 2 sine phi minus 0. So that's actually going to be the same as this. Well, almost. Now I have a, cos a sine instead of a cosine. Now let's do k. I'm going to drop down to the next line just so I have room to write it all out. So cut the third column, take the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. So I have negative 2 sine phi sine theta times 2 cosine phi sine theta. So I have negative 4 sine phi cosine phi sine squared theta. minus 2 cosine phi cosine theta times 2 sine phi cosine theta. So I have 4 sine phi cosine phi cosine squared theta. Well, let's see if I can combine any of these things. And I can. I could actually think about, hold up. This should be a theta. That is my fault. Let's check that one out again. So it should be negative 2 sine phi sine theta times 2 cosine phi sine theta. There's my 2s, my sine phi, my cosine phi, and sine squared theta. Just a lot of stuff going on here. But we've got to fix now. And now we can combine because I can pull a 4 sine phi cosine phi out of both terms in the k coordinate. So it looks something like this. Negative 4 sine phi cosine phi times sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta which we should all recognize from trig as being equal to 1. All right, so 
This looks a little bit more manageable. Now I need to find the magnitude of this. So I'm going to move over here. So let's go ahead and find that magnitude. Moved over here, I'll have a little more space now. So we know the magnitude is going to be the square root of the sum of each of the terms squared. Okay, so I have Okay, let's see if we can combine some of these things. Well, right off the bat, let me look at the first two terms. I could factor out a 16 sine to the fourth theta from each of those. Let's do that. And I can use a trig identity to show that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1. So now I have 16 sine squared phi plus 16 yeah, 16 sine to the fourth phi plus 16 sine squared phi, phi cosine squared phi. So let's pull out a 16 squared phi from both terms. So I have 16 sine squared phi times quantity sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi, which is 1. This is suddenly looking a lot nicer. And then, that's an easy square root to take. I'm going to get 4 sine phi. And now I have my ds. It is 4 sine squared phi d theta d phi. Okay. Well, now I can set up my integral to find surface area of M1. Oh, something that's important to note. When I took that square root of 16 sine squared phi, I didn't bother putting in any absolute value signs because I know the bounds on phi are at largest 0 to pi, and sine is positive for that whole entire region. Okay, so now I need some bounds of integration so I can actually complete this integral. Well, thinking back to the picture, I know that the sphere goes all the way around, so theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. But I'm missing the top half of the sphere, so phi isn't going to go all the way from 0 to pi. Let's draw a picture that can help us. So this is our region, and I know the height of the top of the circle is 1. And I know that the radius of the sphere is 2. This doesn't look like 2 thirds of a 30, 60, 90 triangle. I don't know what it does. The third side is the square root of 3. So that's making this interior angle here 30 degrees. 
this one's 60. So our phi here is going to be 60 or pi over 3. And since the sphere continues going down, pi over 3 is going to be my lower bound and pi is going to be my upper bound. All right, let's start integrating. So first we're going to integrate with respect to theta. 4 sine phi is going to be like a constant. So when I integrate, I'm going to get 4 sine phi times theta. Okay, let's go ahead and plug in. And I'm going to get 8 pi sine phi because 4 times 2 pi is 8 pi. And then when phi equals 0, the second term drops out and I don't have anything else. Okay, let's go ahead and integrate with respect to phi. Well, 8 pi is going to be treated like a constant, and sine of phi, the integral is going to be negative cosine of phi. Still need that integral sign anymore. Okay, let's go ahead and plug those values in. Well, I know that cosine pi is going to be negative 1. So the first term becomes 8 pi. And cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. So the second term is going to become 4 pi. And 8 pi plus 4 pi, 12 pi. And that is going to be my surface area of M1. All right, now let's get started on M2. All right, so let's recall what exactly M2 is. It is the disk that fills the hole in the cut sphere. Should have kept this picture. Let me draw it one more time. Well, we use this for M1, but it also helps us with M2. It gives me the radius of that disk, which is the square root of 3. That's going to help me a lot later. But for now, let's work on paired parametrizing the surface. So I'm actually going to use polar coordinates. So recall well cylindrical coordinates actually. So x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, z equals itself which we know is constant here to be 1. Now let's go ahead and plug in that r as a square root of 3. And we can use this to write out r of x, y. Well, r of r theta. Let's actually leave those square root of threes as r's for right now. So we need to find r sub r and r sub theta. So let's find those two partial derivatives. Well, for the first term, cosine theta is treated like a constant. 
the derivative of r cosine theta is just going to be cosine theta. And likewise for the second term with sine. And then 1 is just a constant, so its partial derivative with respect to r is going to be 0. Now let's do r sub theta. Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of sine is cosine. And again, 1 is a constant. Its partial derivative with respect to theta is going to be 0. Now we need to find the cross product of these two vectors. And I'm going to use a matrix. So the top row is going to be i, j, k, and then the partial derivative with respect to r, the partial derivative with respect to theta. Cosine theta sine theta zero. All right. Let's go ahead and find this cross product. So first let's do i, which means I'm going to cut this first column right here and find the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. So I have actually 0 minus 0. Now let's do j. So cut the middle column. Cosine times 0, minus 0, nothing. Now let's do k. This one's going to be a little bit more interesting. So I have cosine times r cosine theta, which is r cosine squared theta, plus r sine squared theta. I hope you see your favorite trig identity here. This is going to combine to just be R. So now I need to find this magnitude, which is actually going to be really easy. It is the square root of the sum of the squares of each term. So the square root of 0 plus 0 plus R squared. Square root of R is R. So ds is going to be r dr d theta, which probably looks pretty familiar. But let's go ahead and set up that integral for surface area. So it's going to be the integral of ds over our region. Now, our region is that disk of radius square root of 3, so theta is pretty easy. The disk goes all the way around, so theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And using this picture, we found that the maximum radius is the square root of 3, so r is going to go from 0 to root 3. All right, let's start integrating with respect to r. Well, the integral of r is 1 half r squared, and I'm going to evaluate that from r equals 0 to r equals the square root of 3. Let's go ahead and plug in. So I have 1 half times 3 minus 0, so 3 halves. And the integral of 3 halves d theta is going to be 3 halves theta. Which I'm going to evaluate from theta equals 0 to theta equals 2 pi. So plug in 2 pi and I get 3 pi 
plug in zero, I get zero. So the surface area of M2 is 3 pi, which I can add to my surface area for M1 to get 15 pi. which is my final answer for this question.